A listener note, this episode contains adult content and is not suitable for everyone. Please be advised. Clowns, in one form or another, have been around for thousands of years. Ancient clowns were culled from stereotypes and, in some cultures, were part of a royal entourage. Before the 20th century, clown acts focused mostly on sex, food, and making fun of the monarchy, which was always a delicate line. And the fate of the clowns sometimes depended on the mood of the king or queen that day. In 1801, English entertainer Joseph Grimaldi became the father of modern clowning. While he too was irreverent, he relied on the physical humor that is prevalent in the profession today. Grimaldi was also the first to make popular the white face paint with red patches on his cheeks and garish clothes. As the character of the clown transitioned from the theater to the circus, its popularity among children soared. Almost 200 years after Grimaldi first painted his face, the character of Bozo the Clown became one of the most popular TV shows for children in the world. And even the fast food giant McDonald's branded themselves with Ronald McDonald. However, The clown was not always a fun, light character. The 1892 opera Pagliacci was the story of a clown that killed his unfaithful wife, and circus clowns were often likened to inmates in an insane asylum. But it was in the 1970s that the alter ego of a clown named Pogo became the inspiration for what is known today as the killer clown. Because real-life Pogo, John Wayne Gacy, was not part of a circus or vaudeville troupe. He was a murderer, a serial killer, hiding behind makeup and transforming a beloved children's character into a monster. Killer Psyche is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Whether you love true crime or comedy, celebrity interviews or news, you call the shots on what's in your podcast queue. And guess what? Now you can call them on your auto insurance too with the Name Your Price tool from Progressive. It works just the way it sounds. You tell Progressive how much you want to pay for car insurance and they'll show you coverage options that fit your budget. Get your quote today at Progressive.com to join the over 28 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Price and coverage match limited by state law. If you're a fan of Killer Psyche, you'll really enjoy Audible's new collection of thrillers. Their breathtaking, shocking, and sometimes sinister tales are brought to life through an immersive auditory experience. One title that's next on my list is an Audible original called The Justice, which is actually by James Patterson. He's one of my favorite authors. It's about a Supreme Court justice that is blackmailed by a mysterious company. I can't wait to give it a listen. Plus, as an Audible member, you can choose one title a month to keep from their entire catalog. New members can try Audible free for 30 days. Visit audible.com slash psyche or text psyche to 500-500. That's audible.com slash psyche or text psyche to 500-500. From Wondery and Treefort Media, I'm Candace DeLong, and this is the third season of Killer Psyche. I was a psychiatric nurse, and then an FBI criminal profiler. In the five decades I've spent studying people's minds, I've interviewed countless murderers, including many serial killers. Why did they do it? 
To get a satisfying answer, we have to dive deep into their psyche to figure out what made them do what they did. This episode is part one of John Wayne Gacy, The Killer Clown. Late in the afternoon on December 11, 1978, 17-year-old Kim Byers filled out a photo-developing envelope, ripped off the envelope receipt, and stuffed it into the pocket of the coat she was wearing. The coat was a light blue nylon down parka that belonged to her friend and co-worker, 15-year-old Rob Peast. Rob was a high school sophomore, gymnast, and honor roll student at his high school. He was friendly, handsome, and popular. After school, he and Kim both worked at a family-owned pharmacy in Des Plaines, Illinois, a suburb northwest of Chicago. On that freezing December afternoon, Kim was working the cash register near the front entrance. Whenever the doors opened, she was blasted by the cold Chicago wind that passed over Lake Michigan. Rob lent buyers his parka while he stocked shelves further inside the store. About 5.30 p.m., 36-year-old John Wayne Gacy, a portly 5-foot, 9-inch contractor who specialized in pharmacy remodeling, showed up to take measurements for new display units. He chatted with one of the pharmacists at the back of the store and remarked that there were new faces since he had last remodeled two years earlier. The pharmacist said he hired a lot of high school kids, and that meant there was turnover when they left for college. Gacy then loudly boasted that he hired high schoolers for $5 an hour during the summer. An older clerk overheard him and joked with Rob that he should ask the contractor for a job. But for Rob, it wasn't a joke. That was almost double what he earned stocking shelves at Nissan's. Rob picked up his pace, hoping he would impress the contractor with his work ethic. His attempt was unnecessary. Gacy had already noticed Rob, and the talk of the job was really just the bait Gacy was using to reel him in. Around 6.50 p.m., Gacy finished taking measurements and left. A few minutes later, the pharmacist saw that Gacy had forgotten his appointment book on the counter. He did not bother to call him. He guessed that the contractor would quickly realize he had left it and come back for it. The pharmacist was right. Gacy discovered his mistake on the drive home. But Gacy decided to keep going home. He wanted to check his phone messages and return calls first. When Gacy pulled into the parking lot around 8 o'clock, he spotted Rob in the alley taking out the trash. Rob approached Gacy's truck to ask about a summer job, and Gacy told him that he would hang around the pharmacy until the end of Rob's shift. Then the two could talk outside. Rob happily agreed. He was saving up to buy a used car for when he turned 16. A higher paying job would help him reach his goal faster. After he was back inside, Gacy entered and collected his appointment book. Gacy hung around the store, chatting with the pharmacist and pretending to take more measurements. At 8.55 p.m., Rob Peace's mother arrived to pick him up. It was her birthday. His father and two older siblings were waiting back home with a celebratory dinner and cake. A minute later, Gacy exited and Rob followed him out, grabbing his blue parka from behind the counter. He asked his co-worker, Kim, to cover for him for five minutes and told her that Gacy wanted to talk to him for a minute. Then, spotting his mother outside, he hurried over to her and told her that he needed to talk to some contractor about a job, and he would be right there. Outside, Gacy invited Rob to get into his truck, that he needed to come to his house to fill out employee paperwork, but Rob declined to go. He explained that it was his mother's birthday and she was inside waiting on him. Gacy coaxed him inside the vehicle, telling Rob that there would be no better birthday gift for his mother 
than the news of him securing a well-paying job. Besides, he told the teenager, he would drop him at his parents' house within 45 minutes. After a moment of hesitation, Rob got into Gacy's truck. No one would ever see Rob Peast alive again. Gacy drove recklessly, speeding and rapidly switching lanes for the entire 10 minutes it took him to reach his home, a one-story brick ranch with a circular driveway surrounded by tall hedges. When they arrived, Gacy escorted the teenager into a back rec room and offered him a beer from his tiki bar. Rob politely accepted and, concerned about the time and that his family was looking for him, reminded Gacy of the employee paperwork. Gacy went to retrieve the documents from his office at the front of the house, just off a small living room. Peast waited in the living room, surrounded by dozens of clown photos and paintings hung on the walls. Gacy explained that he was a registered clown who performed under the name Pogo. He also claimed to be an amateur magician and showed Rob a trick with a pair of handcuffs. Gacy locked the cuffs on his own wrists momentarily turned his back, and then when he turned back to face the teenager, the cuffs were off. Gacy convinced Peast he could show him how to do the trick himself. He handcuffed Rob's hands behind his back. Instantly, Gacy's friendly demeanor vanished. The trick to getting out of the handcuffs, Gacy revealed, was having the key. Gacy had hidden it between two of his fingers, but he was not offering the key to Rob. Instead, Gacy attacked the teenager, attempting to perform oral sex on him, but later said that the teenager was crying so much that he stopped. Gacy took off the handcuffs and told Rob he would drive him home. As he went to the door to leave, the teen told Gacy that he thought that he was going to kill him. Unfortunately, in that moment, Gacy made the decision that Rob would not leave his home alive. He worried that the teen would tell people what had happened. Gacy informed Rob that before he left, he needed to show him one more magic trick. Gacy slipped a length of rope around Rob's neck and quickly knotted it twice. He then threaded a wood stick between the knots. He twisted the stick, tightening the rope like a tourniquet. Again, Gacy's phone rang, distracting him. This time, he left Rob alone in the room to answer it. And when he returned, Rob was dead on the floor. Gacy picked up Rob's body and carried it to his bed. The phone rang again. It was his aunt. His uncle was at Northwest Hospital and would not survive the night. Gacy said he had business to attend to, but promised to get there within an hour. Back in his bedroom, Gacy had sex with Rob's corpse. Before he showered, he organized Rob's clothes, putting the soiled items in a plastic bag. Gacy liked the blue parka, so he emptied its pockets, tossing the photo development receipt into the kitchen garbage can and hung it in the closet. After his shower, he left the house with the rest of Rob's clothes and disposed of them in dumpsters and recycling bins along the way to the hospital. When Gacy arrived, his uncle had already passed. Gacy joined his family at a relative's house where he stayed for an hour before returning home. That night, he slept with Rob's body next to him. And in the morning, Gacy hid his corpse in the attic and went to work. Meanwhile, Rob's close-knit family had spent the entire night searching for him. When Rob had failed to return from his meeting with the contractor, his mother hurried home to alert the family and call all of his friends. Then she called the pharmacy once again and got the name of the contractor, John Gacy. 
At 11 p.m., the family went to the Des Plaines Police Department and filed a missing person report. They gave the night watchman Gacy's name and phone number. They impressed upon the officer that everyone in their family always let someone know where they were. The next morning at 8.30 a.m., Rob's parents returned to the police station and asked to speak to the detective assigned to the case. That detective called the pharmacist who told him that he had not bothered to call Gacy about his address book because he knew that Gacy would come back for it. The detective then phoned Rob's co-worker, Kim Byers. She confirmed that Rob had gone outside at 9 p.m. to speak with a contractor named John about work. Next, the detective called Gacy's home. He questioned him about the conversation he had with Rob outside the pharmacy the night before, but Gacy denied ever speaking to the teenager. The detective then asked why he had returned to the pharmacy that night. Gacy lied and said he went back to the store because the pharmacist called him about his forgotten appointment book. That contradicted the earlier statement from the pharmacist. And because of that lie, the detective knew Gacy was guilty of something. But of what, he did not yet know. When Rob's family left the police station, the detective informed his supervisor, Des Plaines Lieutenant Joseph Kozensack, of what he had learned. The supervisor had a son who went to school with Rob Peast and gave the detective permission to pursue the disappearance as urgent and to pursue the last person known to have seen him, John Gacy. The detective checked to see if Gacy had a record and learned he had been convicted of sodomy with a teenage boy in Iowa and spent time in prison for it. The lieutenant immediately alerted the assistant state's attorney, Terry Sullivan, about Rob's disappearance and Gacy's possible involvement. Fearing that Gacy might be holding Rob hostage, Lieutenant Kozensack and two other officers drove to Gacy's home to interview him at 9.20 p.m. Gacy seemed unconcerned by their sudden appearance. He invited them in, offered them drinks, and once again, denied ever speaking to Rob Peast. He said that after getting home from the pharmacy, he had gone to the hospital to see his dying uncle and then to a relative's house. The lieutenant asked Gacy to accompany him to the police station to give a statement. Gacy said he had to make his uncle's funeral arrangements and would go later. The lieutenant pressed him for a set time. Frustrated, Gacy finally agreed to show up at 11 p.m. Still, he protested, saying, Don't you people have any respect for the dead? Oh, the irony. But at 11 p.m., Gacy did not head to the police department as he had agreed to do. Instead, he retrieved Rob's body from the attic, wrapped it in a blanket, and loaded it into the trunk of his sedan. Then he slipped past the officers assigned to watch his house and drove about 50 miles south on Interstate 55. Gacy arrived at the huge suspension bridge that spans the Des Plaines River and unceremoniously tossed Rob's body from the bridge. Gacy returned to the Des Plaines police station around 10.30 the next morning. He called his lawyer to let him know the police were questioning him about what he did not know. While Gacy sat with detectives for several hours boasting of his multiple businesses and political connections, Assistant State's Attorney Sullivan secured a search warrant for Gacy's home. While Gacy waited at the police station, four Des Plaines officers and evidence recovery teams searched Gacy's house and seized over 57 pieces of evidence. This included Gacy's black sedan, his pickup truck, and a work van. They collected handcuffs, a board with chains, an empty glass bottle that smelled of chloroform, 
and a hypodermic needle. In addition, they confiscated marijuana and pills from the house and cut out a piece of blood-stained carpet. Detectives also found several pieces of jewelry and driver's licenses, each belonging to a different young man. One of the officers pulled a red slip of paper from the kitchen garbage can. It was the receipt for photo film development that had been in Rob's coat pocket. Over the next week, teams of officers continued surveilling Gacy wherever he went, 24-7. Then on Friday, December 15, 1978, the officers linked a high school ring they had discovered in Gacy's house with the initials JAS to John Allen Sitch. Sitch was a 19-year-old man who had suddenly disappeared on January 20th, 1977. Police spoke to John's mother, who had filed a missing persons complaint after his disappearance. Police had assumed John was a troubled teen who had run away. Obviously, that was not the case. Detectives also tracked down the relatives of some of the IDs from Gacy's bedroom, some that had been missing for over five years. On Tuesday morning, December 19, 1978, Gacy invited two of the detectives who were surveilling him into his home and prepared breakfast. While one of the officers was using Gacy's bathroom, the hot air furnace forced air from the crawl space through the bathroom vent. The officer guessed there was probably a leak in the ductwork and did not think much of it until later that same day when detectives learned that the photo development receipt found in Gacy's kitchen garbage can belonged to Rob's co-worker, Kim. She confirmed she had put the receipt in there while wearing Rob's parka. This was the evidence law enforcement needed to link Robert Peast to Gacy's house. Detectives continued to tail Gacy, hoping that he would reveal where Rob's body might be. That Tuesday proved to be a busy day for Gacy. In the afternoon, Gacy's lawyers filed a $750,000 lawsuit against the Des Plaines police for harassment. The hearing for the suit was scheduled to take place on December 22nd. If the lawsuit went forward, the officers would no longer be allowed to surveil Gacy, thwarting efforts to gather evidence. So time was of the essence. The next evening, the officer who had smelled the awful odor in Gacy's bathroom was sitting home reflecting on the case. He realized he had encountered that smell many times in the city morgue. It was the smell of decaying flesh. The state's attorney used that and the photo development receipt to obtain a search warrant to search Gacy's home for the remains of the body of Robert Peast. The officers watching Gacy saw that his behavior was growing increasingly erratic and they feared he was suicidal but they could not arrest him until they had a body or committed a crime. Luckily, one of the surveillance officers brought up that he had witnessed Gacy gift a young gas station worker a bag of marijuana joints. The detectives brought in the attendant who confirmed it. On Thursday, December 21st, 1978 at 12.15 p.m., Gacy was arrested for the felony of delivering marijuana. While he was being held at the police station, officers began excavating the crawl space under his house. On their hands and knees, the Des Plaines evidence recovery team moved toward areas with depressions which were covered in lime. The technician dug six or seven inches down and unearthed the beginning of what was a massive gravesite. They took two long bones to the county medical examiner who identified them as human leg bones. Gacy, who had collapsed at the police station and was now at the hospital with two officers, was still unaware the police had discovered bodies under his house. But as soon as the hospital cleared him of any health issues, 
he was transported back to the police station where he was immediately booked on murder charges. And this time, Gacy had no key for his handcuffs. Quince offers timeless pieces that never go out of style without spending a fortune. They have staples like European linen dresses, blouses and shorts from $30, and washable silk tops and so much more. The best part is that all Quince items are priced 50 to 80% less than similar brands. That's because Quince partners directly with top factories to cut out the middleman. And they have other things besides clothes. I just ordered a new bedding set and can't wait to get it. What should have cost four to $500 was not even $200. Get warm weather ready with Quince. Go to quince.com slash psyche for free shipping on your order and 365 day returns. That's quince, Q-U-I-N-C-E dot com slash psyche to get free shipping and 365 day returns. Quince.com slash psyche. Killer Psyche is sponsored by BetterHelp. We all carry around different stressors, big and small. And when we keep them bottled up, it can start to affect us in a negative way, which is why it's important to talk through your feelings and things that may be triggering you. Therapy is a safe space to get all of that off your chest and to figure out how to work through whatever's weighing you down. I've been in therapy a few times in my life, and it really, really helped. Sometimes talking to friends and family is not enough, and it's good to work with a professional. So if you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, so it's really convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Get it off your chest with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash Psyche today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash Psyche. John Wayne Gacy was born on March 17, 1942, in Chicago, Illinois. He was the second of three children and the only son born to John Stanley Gacy and Marion Elaine Robinson. His father was a World War I veteran and, after the war, worked as a machinist in a Chicago factory. His father was also an alcoholic who was both physically and verbally abusive. Gacy worked hard to live up to his father's expectations, trying to help with their home's upkeep and repairs. But the elder Gacy was not impressed and regularly called his son stupid. In fact, from the day he was a very young boy until the day his father died of cirrhosis of the liver when John was 27 and serving time in prison, his dad never shied away from expressing his profound disappointment in and his disdain for his only son. And what was the reason for this? Well, his son was not masculine enough for him. Rather than excel in sports and shop class, John Jr. showed more interest in cooking and gardening. And that meant only one thing. His son was a, quote, sissy boy. And he told young John exactly what he thought of him. To say the very least, Gacy's childhood was filled with wall-to-wall -wall emotional physical and mental abuse from his hopelessly alcoholic, cruel, and violent father. Unfortunately, this was not the only abuse he had to endure. There were a series of sexual assaults starting at five years old with a 15-year-old female neighbor fondling him. Then, at only eight, a male contractor who was working next door offered to take him to ice cream and molested him in the car. 
after going with him a few more times, Gacy would run and hide whenever the contractor approached. His mother noticed and told his father, and Gacy revealed what had happened. The next day, Gacy's father confronted the contractor and threatened to call the police. The man left immediately and never returned. Although he was very close with his mother, their relationship was hardly perfect. When he was eight, she humiliated him when she caught him trying on her underwear and discovered that he had hidden a stash of her panties under the front porch. He confessed and said he liked the way the material felt, apparently trying to scare what she feared was a newfound perversion out of him she made him wear a pair on top of his clothes. She told him if she ever caught him with it again, she'd make him wear it and walk up and down the street with it on. Then she told his father, who of course beat him with a leather strap. Not quite the nurturing environment one would hope to grow up in. At age nine, doctors diagnosed Gacy with a congenital heart defect, and he began taking medication. The heart condition prevented him from participating in sports. He put on weight, which turned out to be a lifelong problem. When he was 11 years old, Gacy started having thoughts of hugging his male friends. He was terrified that his father would find out and beat him for being homosexual. According to his own biography, Gacy struggled with his sexual identity when he was only a young boy, school age. He knew he was attracted to boys, and being that way was something one kept to themselves. His sexuality had to be repressed at all costs. In that era, and especially in small towns and small cities, being a homosexual was akin to being a criminal, only worse. Why? Being a criminal was not something other people whispered behind your back. But being a homosexual was, it meant you were a pervert, that you had a mental disorder, and that meant you were to be avoided, shunned by society. It would not be until 1973 when the American Psychological Association removed homosexuality from the DSM as a disorder. But unfortunately, it would take many decades before the majority of Americans agreed with that decision. Although a good student, in the eighth grade, Gacy transferred to a trade school and took his first job at age 14. A year later, he transferred to a different vocational high school. Then he dropped out before his third year. At age 16, he began experiencing blackouts from a cerebral blood clot. Those, by the way, can be fatal. The injury was caused from a swing hitting him in the side of the head five years earlier. Medication dissolved the clot and the fainting spells he'd been having ceased. Here we are again, a serial killer who suffered cerebral damage when he was a kid. Gacy began dating girls in high school and lost his virginity at age 16. His father continued to be a dominating presence in his adulthood. When he was 18 years old, Gacy wanted to purchase a used car. His father convinced him to buy a new car instead and would help him finance it. He made Gacy pay him $100 a month. However, his father claimed the car was his and took it away at the slightest transgression. By March 1962, Gacy fell behind on his payments. In April, he was short again, and rather than face his father, he took the car and fled to Las Vegas. After a few months in Vegas, Gacy wanted to go home. Unfortunately, even with the separation from his father, 
it was way too late for his son to feel good about himself, and the seeds of psychopathy and sexual sadism were already germinating. It wouldn't be long until John Wayne Gacy had developed into a full-blown, violent predator. Gacy returned to Chicago and attended business school. Upon graduation, he found success as a salesman in a men's clothing store. Two years later, 22-year-old Gacy moved to Springfield, Illinois to manage a shoe store, where he began to date fellow employee Marilyn Myers. Gacy and Marilyn married in September of 64 over the objections of her father. Right before the wedding, Gacy had his first homosexual experience, a tryst with a friend that he reportedly enjoyed. About 18 months later, Marilyn gave birth to their son and the couple moved to Waterloo, Iowa, where Gacy's father-in-law owned three KFC franchise stores. Gacy joined the local chapter of the United States Junior Chamber, also known as the JCs, a leadership training service and civic organization for people between the ages of 18 and 40. Gacy fell in with a particular group of businessmen in the chapter who reveled in wife swapping, drugs, and the exchange of pornography. In May of 68, two teenage boys came forward and told their parents that Gacy served them alcohol, forced them to watch pornographic films, and convinced them to have sex by saying he was a part of a psychological research investigation. One of the 15-year-old boys told his parents about the sexual encounters. The father called the police, who were initially hesitant to believe the stories. Gacy had impressed them as a hardworking businessman and strong community supporter. But the county attorney's office found other boys who said they had been to Gacy's house and that Gacy had asked them for sexual favors. A grand jury heard testimony from the two boys and decided to indict Gacy. Not surprisingly, he maintained his innocence, claiming that both teen boys had wanted to have sex with him. He said he had given them drugs, pornography, and cash, and now they were blackmailing him. And by the way, that is a common response on the part of the accused when a teenager accuses them of sexual advances. A few months later, Gacy hired a high school senior to beat up one of the teen boys and keep him from testifying at his trial. The offending teen was caught and confessed, outing Gacy. A few months later, Gacy pled guilty in relation to one charge of sodomy with a 15-year-old boy but pleaded not guilty to charges relating to other youths. He was convicted and sentenced to 10 years. He was also forced to undergo psychological evaluation where the prison psychiatrist concluded that Gacy exhibited antisocial tendencies and could not be medically cured. I could not agree more. His wife divorced him while he was in prison and permanently cut off all contact with her and their children. Smart lady. In prison, Gacy appeared to thrive. He became the head prison cook and started a prison chapter of the JCs and completed his high school equivalency exam. On Christmas Day later that year, Gacy's father died. When he was informed a month later, he was embittered by the late notice and believed his father may have died of embarrassment over his conviction. Afterwards, prison officials noted something. Gacy 
had become very physically aggressive towards some of the prisoners, the homosexual ones. Now, you would think that Gacy was happy that the man who caused him constant fear during his childhood was dead. But I've seen this happen before. The child victim, or who was a child, is still wrapped up with trying to please the abuser, the parent, and they blame themselves and not their abusers. Only six months later, after serving just 18 months of a 10-year sentence, Gacy was granted early release. His probation mandated that he live with his mother in Chicago and adhere to a 10 p.m. curfew. Early in his release, Gacy ignored his curfew. He cruised around downtown Chicago bus stations and an area known as a late-night cruising ground for patrons leaving the gay bars on Clark Street. Only six months after being released from prison, a male teenager told Chicago PD that Gacy picked him up from a bus station and tried to force him into having sex. The charges were dropped when the teenager failed to show up to testify in court. Somehow, the incident escaped the Iowa Parole Board's notice, which means nobody from the Chicago Police Department notified Gacy's parole officer. But Gacy could not keep under wraps his need to kidnap, control, dominate, rape, torture and kill the object of his desire. That was an entirely different problem, and one detailed in great length in the Diagnostic Statistical Manual. And what he truly wanted to do sexually with underage boys was illegal, very illegal. Gacy had so many mental disorders, starting with antisocial personality disorder, psychopathy, which is an extreme form of ASPD, substance and alcohol abuse disorders, sexual sadism, and aphibophilia, which refers to an attraction, a sexual attraction for older adolescents around 15 to 18 years old, just to name a few. But like I said, He really tried to keep those desires as well as his emotions suppressed. And that in turn further repressed his aggression. According to Dr. J. Fox, author of The Will to Kill, that dynamic is known as the frustration aggression hypothesis which basically states that when a desired goal, in Gacy's case, being able to express his true sexuality and interact with like-minded boys and young men, is interfered with by some perceived or real circumstance, in this case, his father's violent disapproval of him. When that happens, an individual will develop hostile thoughts and or actions Simply put, aggression follows the frustration of someone being denied their attempts to achieve a goal. In Gacy's case, the frustration rose from the unattainability of accepting his sexual identity and desires. He could not have what he truly wanted, acceptance as being a gay man and having homosexual relationships. But did Gacy direct his aggression towards his father? Of course not. Kids rarely express aggression towards a parent, especially one like Gacy's father. Somewhere along the line of his repressed psychosexual development, probably in early puberty, John Wayne Gacy's aggressive thoughts and feelings became inextricably woven with sexual arousal and pleasure. And that is the making of a dangerous sexual sadist. 
So what does a sexually repressed man in the 60s do? Well, he could have lived a single life and had the sex life he wanted. It would have been a secret life. But instead, Gacy married twice and had two children. And there is more indication to me that he did it only to provide a respectable cover for himself than any other reason. In the summer of 71, Gacy formed his own contracting company. It was called PDM Contractors for Painting, Decorating, and Maintenance. In order to store materials for his company, he convinced his mother to purchase a house in the northern suburbs of Chicago. A year later, Gacy married Carol Hoff, a financially destitute single mother who brought two young daughters to the marriage. She had been a friend of Gacy's younger sister in high school. Gacy and Hoff briefly dated when they were 16. Before they married, Gacy told her he had been arrested for prostitution that occurred in a hotel he ran in Iowa. But Gacy was financially successful, he was kind to her two daughters, and Gacy's mother moved out of the house to an apartment to make room for them. Gacy told her and her daughters to stay out of his garage. One time after Gacy left the garage with a teenage boy, she snuck inside. There was a mattress on the ground, a red light, and some bikini bottom underwear. Later, under the kitchen sink, she found magazines featuring naked men. One of the pictures was a young man who appeared to have blood on his body. Whatever sexual intimacy they might have had declined and eventually ceased altogether. Ten months later, she could not take it any longer and told John that she wanted a divorce and claimed mental cruelty. Because Gacy was a good talker and charming, he came across as a nice guy. He was active in the community and local politics and loved to do the clown thing at gatherings. And this was how he was able to manipulate people in his orbit. He hosted block parties and he liked to dress as Pogo the Clown and entertain children. But in reality, Gacy, like most psychopaths, was only superficially charming. There is no sincerity true warmth or depth to the personality of a psychopath. They know what to say and how to say it to appear normal, and they have a lot of people fooled. Gacy had no remorse at all for any of his 33 victims. They were nothing more to him than props. In fact, that's what we all are to psychopaths props in their shallow yet dangerous world. John Wayne Gacy was caught because he fell into the trap most serial killers do. He became sloppy, careless. He got lazy and impatient. When Gacy picked up Robert Peast, he did so with multiple witnesses able to identify him. And Gacy knew that the boy's mother was at the pharmacy waiting for her son. But his drive or his need for murder was so great that he could not help himself. And he was narcissistic enough to believe that he would not get caught. For six years, Gacy was able to escape detection. And by the time he was caught, his known victim count was 33. All boys and young men who fell prey to a smooth-talking clown. It's three o'clock somewhere. Time for a My Mochi ice cream snack. My Mochi ice cream is cool, creamy scoops of premium ice cream wrapped in sweet, pillowy dough. And get this— 
all of my mochi's fabulous flavors like strawberry, mango, double chocolate, and cookies and cream are only around 80 calories per piece. Talk about a guilt-free indulgent experience. Each box of My Mochi ice cream has six perfectly portioned gluten-free mochis that are great for grab-and-go. So feel good while curbing your afternoon cravings or the midnight munchies. Yeah, you know who you are with the joyfully chill sensation of My Mochi ice cream. Find My Mochi ice cream at Target or visit MyMochi.com to locate a grocery store near you. At 3.20 a.m., December 22, 1978, with his two lawyers, six Des Plaines police officers, and two state's attorneys present, Gacy admitted to killing approximately 30 to 32 individuals. Police took Gacy to the house to show them where the bodies were buried, but once he saw the mess that law enforcement had made in his house, he refused to cooperate. Police moved forward with the excavation anyway, and over the next four months, 29 bodies were removed from Gacy's home and four more recovered from the rivers. In the second week of January, 1979, a grand jury indicted Gacy on the murder of the six victims that had been identified so far, and also for the murder of Robert Peast. By this time, Gacy had recanted his confession. He maintained that there were several people who had access to his home while he was out of town on business, including two of the teenagers that worked for him. That winter delivered record snowfalls and low temperatures, freezing the ground and making it harder to excavate. As they found bodies, family members with missing sons came forward with dental records and x-rays some finally learning the fate of their loved ones who had been missing for years. Bodies were sometimes buried one on top of another, making it difficult to keep victims' remains intact, which further complicated the identification process. On April 9, 1979, Rob Peace's body was recovered from the Dresden Dam about 65 miles south of Des Plaines. One of the last pieces of evidence recovered from Gacy's house was Rob's light blue nylon parka. The next day, Des Plaines police demolished the home. By this time, 24 of the 33 bodies were identified. On June 21st, 1981, The nine unidentified victims were buried in separate cemeteries with simple stones marking their graves. Three of those victims would be identified at later dates. After his confession, Gacy was taken to the medical wing of the jail for evaluation. The chief psychologist of the Cook County Court's forensic clinic found Gacy had a, quote, psychopathic, antisocial personality with sexual deviation. He further noted that he had hysterical personality and minor compulsive and paranoid personality elements. However, this did not meet the legal criteria for mentally incompetent, and he was cleared to stand trial. Prosecutors moved to try Gacy on all 33 deaths in one trial. The victims had all been murdered between 1972 and 1978 and were all between the ages of 14 and 21. Seven of the cases qualified for the death penalty, which had been reinstated in Illinois in 1974. Gacy's trial began in February of 1980 and lasted six weeks. On March 12th, The jury was out for an hour and 45 minutes. And when the verdict came back, all 12 jurors found him guilty. The next day on March 13th, Gacy was sentenced to death. He was sent to the Menard Correctional Center near Chester, Illinois, where he lived on death row for the next 14 years. 
Gacy received more mail than any other inmate at the prison, and he answered nearly all of it. Callers to his 900 phone line paid $23.88 to listen to the full 12 minutes of his recorded denial of the crimes. Gacy also began producing paintings of his Pogo the Clown character, which he sold to the public. The state sued to collect about $140,000 from the phone call revenue and his painting sales to pay for his incarceration. The state eventually dropped the suit and the funds went to his two children, two stepchildren, and his surviving sister. Shortly after midnight on May 10, 1994, all of John Wayne Gacy's appeals had run out and the 52-year-old was put to death by lethal injection at the Stateville Penitentiary in Illinois. Next time on Killer Psyche, we will speak to Karen Conti, Gacy's attorney during the appeals process. She will tell us what he was like personally and what it was like to represent him. Hey, Prime members, you can listen to Killer Psyche ad-free on Amazon Music. Download the Amazon Music app today, or you can listen ad-free with Wondery Plus in Apple Podcasts. Before you go, tell us about yourself by completing a short survey at wondery.com survey. From Wondery and Tree Fort Media, this is Killer Psyche. I'm your host, Candace DeLong. This episode was written and produced by Lisa Ammerman and Julie Burke. Ann Liu is our producer, and Jada Williams is our associate producer. Story research and additional writings by Ann Liu, Will Christensen, and Jada Williams. Mix and sound design by Matt Dyson, Abigail Sullivan, and Aaron Bauman. Head of audio, Tom Monahan, with audio assistance from Masuzu Enaga. For Wondery, Stephanie Wachneen and Claire Chambers are producers, and Callum Plews is senior managing producer. The executive in charge of production for Treefort is Oscar Guido, and the co-executive producer is Julie Burke. Lastly, our executive producers are Kelly Garner and Lisa Ammerman for Treefort, and Marsha Louie, Morgan Jones, and Aaron O'Flaherty for Wondery. And last but not least, myself, Candace DeLong. The series is produced by Wondery and Tree Ford Media. Audible is the destination for thrilling audio entertainment. Allow your imagination to be piqued by stories that are brought to life through captivating sound design, eerie soundscapes, and dynamic performances. As an Audible member, you'll be able to keep your heart rate up month after month because you can choose one title a month to keep from the entire catalog, including the latest bestsellers and new releases. If you're in the mood for a shocking psychological thriller, check out None of This is True by Lisa Jewell. Embrace brand new exclusive thrillers from bestselling authors who are guaranteed to keep you gripped. New members can try Audible free for 30 days. Visit audible.com slash thrill or text thrill to 500-500. That's audible.com slash thrill or text thrill to 500-500.